Steve Jenkins is on the show. He is uh, he's a Warsaw fan. He grew up in Warsaw. Uh, he also has, I think, something like 260 gold and platinum discs. He is uh, a music mogul, former MD of Jive Records, the biggest independent record label on the planet at the time. And he has written a book called Steve Jenkins, The Future is in the History. And it's going to be launched officially at uh, the new art gallery in Warsaw. Where else? Uh, this Saturday at midday. Steve Jenkins, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Paul. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Now, the interesting thing is, people who love their music may not have heard of you, but <laughs> the artists they listen to uh, certainly will have done. In fact, you've, um, you've shaped the careers of some of the biggest stars on the planet, haven't you? Uh, well, I guess that's true. I mean, I think I pretty much gave my life to the music industry and uh, and spent 40 years in it, you know, and I still dabble occasionally, but um, the big years are probably over now, but uh, it was a great run, a truly great run. And is this always what you wanted to do, to be in the music industry? Um, I think in my very early days I wanted to be a footballer, um, but as that didn't quite work out, then next on the list was uh, was music, and uh, obviously those two, football and music, were my passions, really. Well, obviously you're a Warsaw fan. And I am. You're, you're a big mate with Pete Waterman, who you worked with uh, extensively. Um, no, no thoughts of taking over Warsaw Football Club then, Steve? Oh, well, um, you never know, do you, really? Uh, I mean, Warsaw Football Club is, uh, is so close to my heart, and, uh, you know, I went there... Um, when at first when I was eight years old and um, you know my uh, 50th anniversary is the 22nd of September this year hmm. so it'll be 50 years as a, as a Warsaw supporter so there's no doubt I love that club. When you did uh, for a few years the PA didn't you at Fellows Park? I did it was for about uh, four or five seasons you know I loved it we had a little box there right on the halfway line and uh, and on those cold winter nights, you know, I at least had a radiator, which was uh, delightful. Because <laughs> the career path, um, obviously, you, you worked at Warsaw. You were doing DJing, weren't you, for clubs like Barbarella's in Birmingham? And you got into sort of record promotions, if you like. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I DJed probably from the time I was just before I was 19. And I actually finished when I was about 27. But uh, towards the end, I was only doing Friday nights and Saturday nights because obviously I was working during the week. The, the DJ thing I really loved, though. You know, I would have loved to... Have, I think when I set out, I wanted to be um, a radio broadcaster. That's where I thought my future lay. But, you know, as with most things, you kind of get sidetracked. And uh, I was lucky enough to join the record business, I guess, when I was 21 years old. So who was it that uh, shaped that departure for you, that got you in? Was it one individual or not? It was uh, someone who's worked with me for 30 years now, uh, Susan Buckler. Mm. She worked at Graduate Records in Walsall, and um, I went there one day because I was, I mean, the truth of the matter is I was earning a lot of money from DJing at night, and I wasn't really playing any tax. Not that I want to be chased for that 40 years on. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I thought in my simplistic way, I thought, oh, if I do two days a week in a record store and pay tax on that, I'll probably keep the money from the evening. So I went to see Sue, who was working in graduate records who, in Warsaw, who I knew really well. And she said to me, no, there's no jobs in the record store, but you should work for a record company because of your knowledge and what you know about records. And she showed me Music Week, which I'd never really looked at, apart from looking at the chart. And there, in the back of Music Week, was an advert for a promotion man, of which I didn't even know what a promotion man was at the time. And uh, she said, you should write off after that and go and get that. And if you get in the record business, get me in afterwards. And so I wrote off for it, and... Um, I think there was something like 80 applicants, and I got it. Well, they must have seen something in you, and it's all developed from there. The number of hits that you had for various artists. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I mentioned 260 gold and platinum discs, but um, how many hits in total? Do you know? Um, you know what, Paul? I don't know how many hits in total. I've, I've kind of, uh, in the book, I've put a list of the, the hits 
uh, for each year that we worked, and I still think that I missed some. But I do know that it's 86, 87, or 88 number one singles. Yeah. It's, it's frightening. Yeah, well, it was a long career, though, Paul. You know, I mean, it didn't happen over five years. You know, you, you're talking more like 35 years, you know. Steve Jenkins uh, from Warsaw, a man who uh, whose career started in the West Midlands. Uh, it's the launch of his book tomorrow, uh, midday, at the Warsaw uh, Museum and Art Gallery. Uh, his book is called The Future is the History, His Time, an autobiography, a memoir, his time in the music business. We'll hear more from Steve on the show and talk about some of the people that he worked with before six. BBC WM, uh, we've been talking to Steve Jenkins, who was born in Warsaw, supports Warsaw Football Club, a man who has over 260 gold and platinum discs. He spent a, a lifetime in the music industry. His autobiography, a memoir, is being launched officially at the new Museum and Art Gallery in Warsaw tomorrow, midday. It's called uh, Steve Jenkins, The Future is the History. Former managing director of Jive Records, and he's worked with some of the, uh, the, well, the all-time greats, Bowie, Kylie, Justin Timberlake... Just to name three of the stars that, uh, that he's shaped, if you like. And um, we are talking about the ones that mean more to him than the rest. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, everybody wants to talk to me about Britney Spears, obviously, because, you know, she was such a phenomenon. And I think Baby One More Time, that record had everything right you know from the artist the video the record the record company i'd been working at uh, you know running jive records for 10 years by then so the the record company was in its best shape and so when we issued that record it went to n number one in 63 countries in six weeks which is the most explosive thing i think that ever happened in my career so most people want to talk about you know, Britney Spears and, and Baby One More Time, you know, but obviously, you know, the, I think the Stone Roses were important. Um, one of my personal favourites is R. Kelly, and uh, especially I Believe I Can Fly, you know, I had 27 hit records with R. Kelly during what was a 13-year period. Um, so there's lots and lots of memories for me that that go back even further and of course my partnership with um, Pete Waterman you know and all those hits we had in the 80s was a fantastic time do you know instantly when you hear an artist or you hear a record that it's going to be a hit did you at that in that time well I'd say when you're working at something for 30 years I guess it's like playing football and you're 29, 30 years old, you've been through most of the things that can happen in a game, so you're quite aware of what to do at, at each different point, and I think, you know, working with records is the same thing. You get to know what is attractive, what will sell, and possibly what is a hit record. I have to say, though, you can always get it wrong. <laughs> but um, What's the biggest mistake, then, you made? One you didn't spot that stands out or not? Well, no, there's a couple, actually. Very early on in my career, do you remember The Beat mm -hmm. from Birmingham? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was taken along to see The Beat. They'd not been together that long, and they were playing a gig somewhere in central Birmingham. I remember going there, and I watched them, and I thought, no, I don't think this is really going to work. And within 12 months, they'd got their first hit, and then went on to have a series of hits. So that's most certainly one that I missed. Um, further on down the line, when I was running Jive Records, I fought hard to sign Take That. And um, they actually had the same manager as uh, Damien. I had a big hit with a record called Time Warp by Damien. And, and Damien's manager was putting together Take That, and I desperately wanted to sign them. But I was outvoted at, at board level, so I don't think I can really take total blame for that because I definitely wanted to sign them but that was one of the ones that, that got away so you know I think no matter how good you think you are at it you make mistakes Well your first hit, your first number one was Leo Sayers' When I Need You wasn't it, is that right? It was. Yeah and I mean you've got artists that you work with that are still actually you know reforming and performing like Steps and the Stone Roses are back playing Backstreet Boys back playing and I know that Aaliyah is one that you worked with who very sadly died she was only what 22 when uh, that's right when she died and you feel that she would have been a true absolute superstar had she actually lived and the music 
Carry uh, on if you like. Oh, without any doubt. I think Aaliyah was the full ticket. She had everything, you know. And uh, on top of that, she was a fantastic girl. You know, I had a great, great time with Aaliyah. Um, we only worked one album, really, um, before she moved on to another label. But And she was 14 and 15 years old at the time. But Aaliyah's most definitely one of my favourites and um, a, a tragic end, really, through just overloading a plane with equipment, you know. Yeah, and when you when you heard about the, the plane crash, were you in a... So having scanned the, were you in an airport somewhere? Or? Well, yeah, actually, I was in an airport, and I was, you know, doing one of those... Um, I, I can't even remember what airport it was now, but it's in the middle of America. I'm in an airport, and I'm waiting for a connection to come back to England. And um, I, I, across the airport uh, lounge, I saw pictures of Aaliyah. And, you know, when you see two or three, four pictures of her, it kind of looks strange. So I moved over to the TV to have a look at it. And that's, of course, um, when I heard the, of, about the, pl the plane crash, you know, yeah. which was sickening. It was sickening. Well, you've had a, an exhibition of, uh, of your life in the music business uh, in Warsaw a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And the launch of the book officially is at the new uh, art gallery in Warsaw this Saturday at midday. And are, are you involved at all in the music business now? Because it has massively changed, hasn't it? The record business probably started to change um, from what we all knew it, probably in 2002 with Napster. Mm. Uh, and then, of course, the development of the internet and downloading. And, you know, we're 10 years on from that now. So it's a completely different business to its heyday. Yeah, but it's been a, a great life. And uh, Warsaw Art Gallery, lunchtime tomorrow, midday, just ahead of the Warsaw game with Huddersfield. Steve Jenkins will be there to launch his uh, autobiography, The Future is the History. If you're a music fan, you need to join him. Steve, great to talk to you. Paul, really good to talk to you. Hopefully I'll see you soon.